basically what we aim in uh, with this work is to use guided waves to reconstruct basically a, a wall thickness uh, profile along the circumference of the pipe, uh, doing so with guided waves that travel around the circumference. The method has its own limitations because, of course, um, there's limited information in it, but uh, I will show that to some extent you can uh, fairly well uh, reco reconstruct uh, all, the, all profiles, assuming that not too complicated shapes. The whole context of this uh, uh, talk is that we have been working on guided wave tomography for several years now. And guided wave tomography <coughs> uses basically two rings of sensors around the pipe. And what basically happens is, is that you transmit from one transmitter uh, to the opposite receiver ring. And you do so for uh, all sources in the transmit ring. Collecting a full data set, taking into account also higher order helical waves. Uh, to interrogate basically the pipe in between the two rings. And with that you can basically obtain a data set with a lot of travel times and these travel times are the input uh, for a nonlinear uh, inversion scheme where you basically uh, invert for the wall thickness in between two rings. And this method is aimed uh, to be uh, quantitative and provide you the absolute wall thickness. Uh, typically, applications that you would apply such a technology is, is locations where you cannot physically access uh, the pipe surface, uh, for example, a uh, pipe support. With this technique, uh, we've done a lot of experimental work and shown show that you can actually do quantitative sizing with that, and that's, that's basically illustrated in this graph. What we did is we machined defects and uh, made them gradually deeper and deeper. And, and, uh, evaluated how well uh, the deepest uh, or the remaining wall matched with what the tomography showed. And here in the graph, you see some tomograms, which are already a few years old, where you see uh, a defect uh, gradually growing and becoming deeper and deeper. And uh, basically, you should read these pictures as, uh, this is the circumference of the pipe, this is the length of the pipe. Typically, here, we're talking about distances of four, about four meters. Uh, and the color basically represents the absolute wall thickness. The guided wave tomography is really intended to be uh, quantitative and, in, in, and essentially uh, provide you similar information as uh, ultrasonic wall thickness measurements. What we're trying to do here is basically uh, simplify the approach, having one uh, transmitter receiver scanning uh, the 12 clock position of a pipe and then based on the uh, phase information uh, in, the, in the data, reconstruct uh, the wall profile. Um, the idea is that it's semi-quantitative, uh, less precise than guided wave tomography, uh, but uh, it, it, it's intended to give you an impression about the severity of the corrosion. The concept is, uh, is quite simple. Basically, you would have uh, a transmitter and receiver being the same uh, sensor actually, which you move along uh, some location of the pipe, could be the 12 o'clock position, could be the 3 o'clock position, whatever is accessible. Then what happens is that waves travel <coughs> around the pipe and um, they collect information about the wall thickness. Comparing this to a location where there's no corrosion uh, allows you uh, to evaluate the difference in, in phase and from that perspective, get some information about the wall. Here it's a little bit more uh, uh, shown in, in detail. Again, basically the waves travel around the pipe, and basically for every wall, uh, position on, along the wall, uh, you'd have a phase velocity, and you accumulate that uh, to cover the full uh, circumference. And that gives you the, <coughs> the phase of, uh, of the signal. So what we do, in, uh, in, uh, basically, uh, we scan along the pipe, taking measure, measurements at, at, on a regular distance, and uh, compare uh, uh, the measurements on the location with a defect uh, with measurements on a location where there's no, uh, no defect. And then essentially, uh, we minimize uh, the phase difference over a wide 
uh, frequency range uh, in such a way that we estimate the parameters over well, parameters of the shape of the defect. So in this formulation, uh, we have the, the measured uh, reference phase, we have the measured phase, and if there's a difference, the difference has to come from uh, the fact that there's wall loss, and uh, we minimize then basically uh, the difference uh, assuming uh, some defect shape with, which we can describe with a limited number of parameters. I have to emphasize here that basically because it's a transmission measurement you don't know uh, where the defect will be around the circumference, that's obvious. Uh, but in most cases uh, you can make a fair guess where it is normally, it's, a, it's about at the 6 o'clock position of a pipe support where, when you have, uh, for example, bottom of the line corrosion, you know uh, where to look for it because uh, yeah, um, that's basically the, the physics behind the corrosion process. The whole trick is that you minimize the number of parameters that you use to describe the defect, otherwise the problem becomes uh, uh, instable and there's simply too little information. Also in this situation we assume that the defect is symmetrical uh, because yeah, uh, that further reduces the information that uh, you need to put in. And then basically this illustrates how the uh, process works. What we have here is on the left we have frequency versus phase. Um, the second column is basically uh, similar information but then shown in time domain so you have uh, a signal after dispersion correction in a situation that there's no defect and uh, the, signal, the same dispersion correction being applied to a signal when there is a defect and then you see this, this over correction effect that the signal starts ringing. Then basically here, this is uh, the red line, the red curve is, is the actual wall profile and the blue curve, which is uh, gradually adjusted, uh, is the wall profile uh, that you're trying to, that you're inverting for. And then here, uh, with a few parameters, you can basically describe the wall. And you see the inversion process converging in the end. Uh, basically, uh, the phase difference is, is zero and the signals in time basically overlay on top, on top of each other. Uh, and then here you still only see the red curve, maybe a little bit of the blue, but then it has converged and you, you obtain the wall profile. So far this was all um, experimental work and uh, we decided to take it one step further and uh, see what you can obtain experimentally. To keep things a little bit simple, uh, we started working on the plate and in this plate we machined uh, defects which really became deeper and deeper and we used uh, two EMS, one transmitting, one uh, receiving and then manually moving the EMS over the plate as is basically illustrated uh, here. We increased uh, the wall loss from 10 to 70 percent and we looked at two, two different uh, sizes of defect basically a more spherical defect with a radius of 65 millimeters and a similar one but then with a radius of 130 millimeters. And if you look at the data, and this was after dispersion correction, then if you look carefully, step by step, you could see the imprint of the defect appearing. And this is for the defect radius 65, so diameter of 130, then the imprint is not that clear, uh, but when you go to a larger defect and clear you, you see, for example here, the residual dispersion being present <coughs> in the data, which tells you uh, that there's a defect uh, and that's basically what we use as input for the inversion. If you then look at, uh, well, if you then collect all the travel time differences um, for the different defects, we get uh, similar pictures, uh, basically here and we have the location on the plate and uh, here is a defect and the defect depth uh, is increasing from uh, 10 to 70 percent and then basically you see more uh, time shifts essentially in, uh, in the data. This data set had a few bad points, these, these two, uh, so please ignore these, this is just uh, bad measurement. 
So as I said, uh, the inversion scheme uh, uses uh, the phase difference. Um, we looked at two different approaches uh, using a simple mathematical function to describe the defect and a more generalized uh, way where we parameterize the defect with a number of parameters and use cubic interpolation uh, to reconstruct the wall profile because that's more generic and, and assumes less of, of uh, the actual wall profile. But here in the second case it's important to use the symmetry otherwise uh, yeah, you get very strange, strange shapes. Um, and we, we use some upper and lower bounds in the inversion scheme uh, in order to avoid uh, oscillations in the, uh, in the inversion. Basically, to illustrate, um, here's a situation where we have 80% uh, wall loss, and um, this is basically on the vertical axis frequency, on the horizontal axis uh, the location on the plate, and here you see. Uh, and basically this was windowed out with the amplitude uh, of uh, the signal itself to avoid using low amplitude uh, uh, signals. And here you basically see uh, the phase uh, and the initial plate model. In this situation we use, uh, let's say, uh, a 2D inversion, uh, both, let's say, inverting in this direction and in this direction simultaneously. Uh, to stabilize the problem a little bit, uh, a little bit further. At the end of the inversion, uh, you basically see we removed all phase, uh, and basically this ends up in this uh, this wall map. And then here, basically, the colors uh, are the wall, the wall thickness in uh, in millimeters. Well, here there are the results uh, for the. Defect with a radius of 130 millimeters, so a diameter of 260. I'm not sure where it's readable, but this is 10%, 30%, 50, 70%. Uh, percent. And basically, here on the color bar indicated uh, the, the wall loss that was determined from, uh, from the inversion result. So, overall, uh, in this case, we were able to size uh, the remaining wall with an accuracy of about 10%, maybe a bit more. Um, so that's basically in, in, in light in the scope of what we had in mind with this, uh, this approach. Um, when the defect becomes smaller, then obviously the, the phase rotation that you have is, uh, is less. And then it becomes a little bit more, uh, more challenging, but, but still uh, reasonable sizing with a few outliers. Uh, particularly this one uh, it was supposed to be 30% uh, and ended up giving Giving 50 percent, it's not completely clear from the data why why that happens, and that's something that we need to look further into to understand uh, why, in some cases, it's uh, uh, over or underestimates. Basically, there is no. Uh, it's not really clear whether it's in all situations over overestimating or underestimating. And then when you when you collect all uh, data points for the two different types of defects. Then, when the defect is, is large enough, and it's the, that's the blue curve, then basically you find a curve uh, with a slope uh, of nearly one and a correlation coefficient of uh, 0.9. There's one obvious outlier, that's, that's this one, uh, but overall the sizing is uh, quite reasonable. When the defect is, is smaller, then uh, you get a, a systematic undersizing, uh, and then the slope. Uh, is only uh, 0 0.7 instead of uh, instead of 0 0.1. But uh, because uh, you you get a, the diameter of the spot, uh, we feel that you you might be able to do a kind of correction uh, on this because uh, this is a systematic uh, effect <coughs> simply because the phase rotation is uh, too little. And finally, I have a result um, where uh, where I compare, let's say. The inversion result for, the, for let's say, a simple uh, function with two or three parameters and a more generalized uh, function using a, an interpolation, a cubic interpolation. And then the results are very similar and it's better to see in this, uh, this situation. Um, obviously, when you have a function which describes the defect reasonably, uh, you get a better match uh, 
uh, in terms of uh, wall loss. But even when you have uh, a function which has parameterization of about uh, two and a half centimeters uh, in this direction, you can still uh, fairly well reconstruct the shape, uh, provided, of course, that the shape is uh, not too complicated. And the parameterization is able to capture the, the essence of the, of the, of the wall loss. So coming to my conclusions, um, we have some further encouraging results on 1D uh, profiling. Um, from this we, uh, we see that you have a fair size and accuracy typically in the order of uh, 10 percent, in some cases uh, a little bit more. Um, when the defect becomes too small, uh, you get a systematic undersizing of the defect. But the problem is basically that um, you could say you can, you can go to higher frequencies, but then uh, the A1 mode starts to come in and starts to interfere uh, with the S0 mode. So there's a uh, somewhat uh, physical limit in uh, how far you can, you can push it. Uh, you, might, you might consider uh, trying to develop a sensor which uh, uh, is really a more pure mode excitation, but so far we haven't put any effort in that. And we will further look into the parameterization to make things as general as possible uh, and evaluate that on, uh, on several <coughs> parts uh, with, for example, uh, bottom of the line corrosion. I thank you for your attention. If there are any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Yeah, um, <coughs> how sensitive is the phase <coughs> method to adhesion of the pipe wall on the inside of these? Material building up and so on. Is that going to confuse the measurement? Um, possibly. <laughs> um, depending, uh, the idea is that you take your reference as close as possible to the real defect, and as then, um, uh, if the, the deposition on the, on the inside is quite uniform, uh, I can imagine that that might work. But uh, okay. it, it is something. Um, that might affect the, the, the measurement, yeah, right. And, and probably the, the, the only thing <coughs> you have, the, the integration over the distance, is that the circle of natural? Yeah. Okay. yeah, we have basically uh, a wave traveling in two directions, and they'll see the same amount of wall. Uh, so what you, what you measure uh, can be described in this it's way. It's a bit confusing because it said L, so I thought it was the length of the... Of the well, it's a length, the length, the length around the circumference, yeah. 2 pi or whatever. Uh, and the second question that I have is, uh, uh, is the inversion going to be worse if the edges of the <coughs> of the wall um, thickness uh, reduction are going to be sharp? Because now you, you, you have kind of a, a gradual yeah. uh, uh, decrease, but if there are sharp edges, it's... Uh, um, <coughs> probably, basically, most mode conversion, I think, on the sharp Yeah, you might get some, some mode conversion, and um, the thing is, basically, we use a 1D assumption, and uh, when you have uh, sharp edges, where you have significant refraction effects, and then that might also affect uh, the measurement. So that's why we're a little bit uh, careful not stating that this is intended to be absolutely quantitative, but semi-quantitative, because all that these... That may also be one of the reasons why for a smaller defect, with the same loss in percentage, yeah. actually, you have a, a less uh, accuracy in, uh, in yeah, uh, if you look, at, look uh, versus... Uh, if you look carefully in the data, you see some, some diffraction effects uh, from the edges occurring. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, in your experiments, all those defects were not at all? No, there were, were machine defects with, with a, a granular shape. So, do you, you, you use the S0 mode, right? Yeah, we use the S0 mode. In the low region of the dispersion case for this recording, for this uh, low region, uh, how did you uh, uh, find the optimal frequency? Basically, it, it's just going as, as, as high as possible uh, oh. without having too much interference of, uh, let's say, the A1 mode. That's basically the whole the whole concept. Uh, you could as well do the same trick with the, the A0 uh, or the, yeah, the A0 mode or whatever other mode you're using. Uh, 